What's the theme this week? Hymns that that you can hum and hmm. Okay, and so I'm certain I'm purposely trying to mix things around a little bit, even with this the song, to get us to think about what we're singing to think about how it impacts our relationship with our Creator God, our Heavenly Father, through a restored relationship through Jesus Christ. What's the emphasis of these two stanzas this morning? Yes. God's creation praising Him, which wraps itself all around the concept of... Starts with a W. Worship. Yes. You know, as I reflect on Dr. Shu's life, um, and I've said this already, he enjoyed this campus. He enjoyed other campuses we've been on. He enjoyed seeing God's handiwork. But he was always careful that he worshiped the Creator and not the creation. That's a significant difference. I want us to go to Isaiah chapter um, 44 as we, I try to connect the whole idea of worship and the focus of our worship. And I want to read an extended passage in Isaiah 44. I want you to follow along in your translation because um, there may be some variations, but I think uh, what God intends to communicate what comes through in probably all of your translations. So um, I want to start in Isaiah 44. And uh, we'll, we're going to go to another passage in a bit. But I want to just go through this. Isaiah 44, starting at verse 6. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, I am the last. There is no God besides me. Now, God's always fair. God is always fair. Verse 7, here's God being fair. Okay, and who's like me? Come on, tell me. That's not in your translation, but what God's saying is, come on, who's like me? Okay, I'll be fair. Let him proclaim and declare it. Yes, let him recount it to me in order. Okay, so God is a God of order. So you can't just like pick random events if you think you're better than I am. If you think you're God. You, you got to do it in order. And here's the order. From the time that I established the ancient nation and let them declare to them the things that are coming and the events that are going to take place. So God is saying, okay, you, you, I'll, give, I'll be fair. You think you're God? Start at the beginning. Tell me what happened at the beginning and tell me everything that has happened in order. Okay, that's kind of easy because if you look at scripture, God gives us an order, right? So he's given them a fighting chance. He's being, God's being fair. But then he says, and tell me what's going to happen in the future. Go on. So Saturday, do you all know exactly how Saturday is going to go? I mean, I know you know you have a schedule, right? So you have an idea of how Saturday is going to go. But you don't know where you're going to make a mistake on your music. You don't know if somebody's going to leave something behind. You don't really know exactly how Saturday is going to go, do you? But God's being fair. He said, okay, you want to be, uh, you want to say you're God? Tell me. Start from the beginning and go into the future. Tell me what's going on. Who can do that? Is there any God that can do that? Just one. Just one. Verse 8. Do not tremble and do not be afraid. Have I not long since announced it to you and declared it? See, God's telling you, look, I can do that. Any God you pick can't, but I can do that. Do you understand I'm God? Here are my witnesses. Is there any God besides me? Or is there any other rock? I know of none. God gives a, gives a fair chance to say, hey, I'm God. But when we really look at the criteria, nobody stands up to the test. Now, in verse 7, there's a little shift of focus. 
Because the change in fo focus is from God knowing all to those who say, well, I'm going to make gods anyway. Make graven images. This is a picture of a graven image. And in this light, it, it's a snake. Okay? It's a snake. How many of you would love to worship a snake? Any hands? I had an experience this past spring in our shed. I opened the door, let the sun in, and I came back two or three hours later. And as I came around the corner, there's a pile of bricks there inside the shed. And as I came around the corner, I went to reach for a brick, and there was a snake coiled up right there. I almost wet my pants. Okay, it was like, whoa! Okay, in our area, you have to watch out for copperheads. Now, it turned out it was just a harmless black snake, but I got my cardiac rehab for the day, okay? My heart was just pounding. I don't really like snakes. So I have a hard time understanding how people would want to worship a snake. But some people do. Verse 9 begins a discussion that I find very interesting God shares with us. Those who fashion a graven image, all of them are futile. And their precious things are of no profit. Even their own witnesses fail to see or know, so that they will be put to shame. Verse 10. Who has fashioned a god or cast an idol to no profit? Now that's interesting. You know, when I think of idols, I don't normally think of the person who makes an idol is doing it to make money off of it. Think about that. They're trying to get something out of that. They're trying to make some money off it. But God's word is very clear. Look, you know, don't think some of these people have totally altruistic motives for creating idols. They're trying to, they're trying to get something out of it. They're trying to make money off of it. And that's an interesting concept. But then he goes on. Verse 11, Behold, all his companions will be put to shame, for the craftsmen themselves are mere men. Let them all assemble themselves. Let them stand up. Let them tremble. Let them together be put to shame. God's saying, shame on you. Shame on you. You should know better. I'm not like that. I'm the only God, and all you're trying to do is make money off of people. Verse 12, the man shapes iron into a cutting tool and does his work over the coals, fashioning it with hammers and working it with his strong arms. You get the picture of the blacksmith pounding? How many of you have ever seen a blacksmith in operation? It's interesting, but it's hard, dirty work. He also gets hungry. His strength fails. He drinks no water and becomes weary. Now another shapes wood. He extends a measuring line. He outlines it with red chalk. He works it with planes and outlines it with a compass and makes it like the form of a man, like the beauty of man, so that may sit in a house. How many of you are into carving? Okay, one or two. My youngest son loves to carve. Okay, he's not very good at it, but he's getting better at it. Okay, but he likes to create interesting designs and then he gives them as gifts to people okay the picture here is of someone carving an idol for people to worship so there's a man carving something from a block of wood that's interesting surely verse 14 he cuts cedars for himself and takes a cypress or an oak and raises it for himself among the trees of the forest he plants a fir and the rain makes it grow then it becomes something for a man to burn so he takes one of them and warms himself. He also makes a fire to bake bread. He also makes a god, same kind of wood. He also makes a god and worships it. He makes it a graven image and falls down before it. Now we get the advantage of God, in his perspective, stepping back and saying, now think about that. Think about that. They plant a tree, they water it, it grows, they cut it down. They chop it up, they use some of the wood to warm themselves, some of it to bake food, then they carve an idol out of it, and they worship the idol. Now, if we're honest with ourselves, does that make sense? When we see it from God's perspective, we realize how ridiculous that is, right? Verse 16, half of it he burns in the fire. Over this half he eats meat, warms himself, and says, Ah, I'm warm. I have seen the fire, but the rest of it he makes into a god, his graven image. He falls down before it and worship it, worships. 
He also prays to it and says, oh, Deliver me, for thou art my God. It's ridiculous. It really is. They do not know, nor do they understand, for he has smeared over their eyes. So they cannot see, and their hearts, so they cannot comprehend. Smeared over their eyes. May I see your glasses? Now, can you see well without your glasses? Okay, then I can give it. Who can't see well without their glasses? Nancy, may I see your glasses? I have an experiment for you to do today, Nancy. Okay, you ready? I want you to go through the entire day and wear your glasses like that. Do you think you can do it? I don't want them back. <laughs> I used mouthwash this morning. Do you think with your glasses smeared like that, you'll probably have to clean them again? You do have some Lysol disinfectant, don't you? Okay, then we're good. Do you think that you could go through the day, Nancy, with your glasses like that? She's still in shock. Oh, she's got a, she's got a lens cleaner. That's okay, I had granola for breakfast, so there shouldn't be too many chips in the glass. <laughs> Think of it this way, you know, I could have I been worse, Nancy. I could have brought some Vaseline. That would have been terrible. But you know what, that's what God's word is saying. Look, they have made a choice to worship a block of wood, and I'm going to just, their heart is set against me. I'm going to smear their eyes over. They're going to go through life with messy vision, blurred vision. Have you ever gotten Vaseline on your glasses, Nancy? <laughs> Have you ever gotten like oil smudges? Yes. Isn't it annoying? I mean, I, I wore glasses from the time I was in first grade till about uh, uh, age one until I was uh, about 17. Uh, and it's only as I've gotten older that I've had to use these cheaters. But Time and time again, as I would go through the day as a young person, I would find myself doing this, this all, and, and adjusting the glasses with your nose, that always bugged my mother. But I would start squinting because I would get, I would handle my glasses, I was a dumb kid, okay? And they would get smudges on them, and everything got blurrier as the day went along, and then my mother would say, Dan, clean your glasses, how can you see out of those? That's exactly the picture here. They do not know nor do they understand, for he has smeared over their eyes so that they cannot see, and their hearts so they cannot comprehend. Here's the other thing. And no one recalls, nor is there knowledge or understanding to say, I've burned half of it. What's it? Block of wood, right? I have burned half of it in the fire, and I also have baked bread over its coals. I roast meat and eat it. Then I make the rest of it an abomination. I fall down before a block of wood. He feeds on ashes. A deceived heart has turned him aside, and he cannot deliver himself, nor say, Is there not a lie in my right hand? Their understanding because of what their heart condition is and because instead of worshiping God, they're worshiping the creation. Those, those two stanzas in This Is My Father's World, all of creation is worshiping God. We're the one part of his creation that has a tendency not to worship God. <coughs> Our eyes can become smeared over. Any of you have ever had um, a cookout and not realize it, but your brother or your sister accidentally knocked the hamburger in the ashes and then put it back on hoping no one would eat it? Ah, uh, yeah, do what you have, right? And you bite into that wonderful hamburger and you get charcoal taste. <laughs> that ash in your mouth. Is it delicious? Actually, it's for my brother. Uh, oh, you gave it to your brother. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. What was his reaction? Did he go, mm, num, 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 or did he kind of like want to spit it out? He was kind of a slow reaction. 
So he's just oblivious. Okay. <laughs> I've I've done that before where I, I've actually knocked something into the into the charcoal just a little bit. I quick fish it out. It's like, ah, oh, it'll be okay. If I cook it for another minute or two, it'll burn the ash off. And then I bite into it. It's like, ugh. Okay. And that's what God is saying here. It's ashes. He feeds on ashes. How many of you would like to go to lunch and fill your plate with ashes? Wouldn't that be delicious? Where's Shay? There she is. Shay, I have a question for you. If I came up to you and I said to you, and of course I will always sneak up on you so that you can't see me coming, okay? But if I, if I snuck up on you and I just popped in front of you and said, what's up dog? What would you think? Uh, I'd say hi. Okay. <laughs> You'd say hi. What, what comes to some of, some of your minds, some of you in your minds, if I say to you, what's up dog? Oh, oh, oh. Randy Jackson. Who? Randy Jackson. Randy Jackson? Who in the world is he? Who? He's from American Idol. He's from American Idol. I, I have a picture here. Any of you watch American Idol? Any of you watched that? I really haven't watched it the last two seasons, but I tuned in and I saw this picture, and I, I got a question for you. Who does Woody look like? <laughs> <laughs> What's the point of American Idol? What's the point? Talent? Is that really the point? It's like, look at me, I'm talented. Yeah, have you seen some of those people sing? Talk about smeared over eyes. Okay, they're a train wreck waiting to happen. Yes. Money. Money. They want what? They're going for a what? A big fat record contract. Yes. Fame. There's a lot of people, in fact, a couple seasons ago, I lost count of the number of people that would say, oh, this means so much to me, and if, if I don't win, and, and they were just in the initial audition stage, if I don't win, my life is basically over. Like, wow, that's, that's sad. That's really sad, because what had, beco what had that become? It had become an idol. So my question is, what do, we, what do we idolize? What's an idol in our life? Go over to Romans chapter 1. Because Isaiah is echoed in Romans chapter 1. Starting at verse 17. Oh, I have failed you. It is page 233 in my Bible, if that helps you at all. Romans chapter 1, verse 17. How are we supposed to live? Those of us who acknowledged our broken relationship because of sin with our Creator God, who have accepted God's free gift of salvation through Jesus Christ to pay completely the penalty of our sin and rebellion and had a restored relationship. Is this the way we're supposed to act? Or is Romans chapter 1 verse 17 the way we're supposed to act? For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it's written but the righteous man shall live by what? Idols? What? Faith. We are to live a life not focused on the things that grab our attention, but focused on who God is and trusting Him. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them. For God made it evident to them. It's talking about creation. For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen. Being understood 
through what has been made so that they are without an excuse. Here we come back to those stanzas we sang in This Is My Father's World. They said, unlike the creation, the creation all points to God. It says it there in Romans. And they, what, the, what have they done? I'm not going to worship God. I'm going to worship the creation instead of the one who created it. That's tragic. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without an excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they came, became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. What happens, Nancy, when I smear your, totally smear over your glasses? Besides it being blurry, what comes through? It, it's distorted. A, a lot of the light is blocked. Your life becomes darkened. It's exactly what it's saying here. Verse 22. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. It's talking about idolatry. Therefore, verse 24, God gave them over in the lusts of their heart to impurity that their bodies might be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So what's your idol? Oh, I don't have any idols. I don't have anything sitting on a shelf somewhere. I don't have some icon picture on the wall that I bow down and pray to three times a day. So I don't have any idols. Idolatry we think of very typically as something, right? Like that picture I showed you of the snake. It's something. I would propose to you that truthfully idolatry is anything you worship other than God or anything that comes between your relationship with God. So it can be things. It's always amusing to me, new campers, when they haven't really read the website or the instructions well, and they go, wait, I have to give up my cell phone? I have to turn in my cell phone when I come to Che? You just cut off my arm. Something as simple as a cell phone become, can become an idol. But I want us to think deeper. If idolatry really involves putting anything between you and your relationship with him, I would suggest something more subtle in our lives and more pernicious in how it disrupts the relationship we are to have with God. And that is our unwillingness to trust our unwillingness to trust God. And here's how it works. Because it sneaks into our lives. It sneaks into my life. Something happens. I don't know how this is going to work out. I'm concerned. We don't say worried. But what we're really saying is, God, I know better than you. What's just happened? God, I know better than you. What's just happened? Who's become the idol? Oh, come on. Yeah. That's a little painful to admit, isn't it? That our lack of trust in God, yeah, we're not, you know, we're not bowing down to something, some created thing, but what we're really doing is we're bowing down to ourselves. We're saying, God, I know better. I think for some of us raised in a Christian home, it can be very challenging because we can get all involved in the mechanics of living the Christian life, and it's kind of like a checklist, kind of like a, you're going to have a dorm clearing checklist, right? Those of you that are leaving on Saturday, and you've got to go down through and check off all the boxes, and if all the boxes are checked, you're good to go, right? And you trust in that. 
you trust in that because then you'll finally get your cell phone back and your, maybe your iPod and then you can begin life again. Yeah. And some of us as believers resort, resort to that checklist in our walk and we carry this enormous burden of performance. Well, if I don't do this and do that and do this and have my checklist, then um, I'm not a good Christian. And ironically, being a good Christian becomes your idol. And God's saying, no, I'm here. I want you to talk with me. I want to carry some of those burdens for you. It's not that he doesn't want you to be a good Christian, but he wants to carry the responsibilities. God's word says, my yoke is easy and light. Living the Christian life should not wear you down unless you've made that your idol. Anything that comes between you and your Heavenly Father, whether it's lack of trust, putting yourself up as God, whether it's good activities, if it interferes with your relationship with your Heavenly Father, you need to straighten that out. I have a memory, Graham, if you'll come, and we'll open to uh, 349 and Randy. I have a memory as a young boy very young boy, probably four or five, of sitting on my father's shoulders in Alaska as a, in a Halloween celebration in the orphanage that my parents worked in. And don't ask me why I remember this, I'm just strange, okay? But this has stuck through me year after year. 349, verse 3. When it comes to idolatry and putting God first, there's not a burden we bear, there's not a sorrow we share, but our toil he does richly repay. Not a grief, not a loss, not a frown nor a cross, but is blessed if we trust and obey. Trust God. Trust and obey. There's no other way in our relationship with our Heavenly Father. Are you trusting him? To be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Because we can never, never prove the delights of his love until all on the altar we lay. Anything and everything that is an idol in our lives, we've got to lay on God's altar and say, it's yours. It's not mine. For the favor he shows and the joy he bestows are for those who trust and obey. Dr. Shu understood that. Do you think Dr. Shu never struggled with an idol in his life? I can tell you some things he has, and I won't because I'm out of time, he has shared with me and others. He struggled just like you and I. But you know what was a fantastic testimony? He constantly put those on the altar and he said, it's not right God. That's come between you and me. It's yours. I'm going to trust you and obey you. This song has resounded through my life that I need to trust God and obey him. It's not enough to trust. It has to be followed up with actions. Today, as you think about what's an idol in your life, are you willing to let it go? Place it on the altar and then obey God so that you can have that joyful relationship. Randy, let's sing the last verse of that song. Father, I have to 
I have to admit. I'm a little jealous of Dr. Shu right now. He's sitting at your feet, fellowshipping with you. I'd like to be there too. But for whatever reason, you have me still on this earth. Each one in this room is still on this earth. And so our worshipful response now is to trust and obey you. To put no other gods before you. To trust and obey you. Father, help me to live that in reality. Help each of us to live that in reality. And then someday in the future, we'll get to sit with Dr. Shu at your feet. And the fellowship will be sweet. And we'll be able to see your face. Thank you, Father, for the joy that you give us now. Help us to live in the reality of worship of you as the creator and not a worship of the creation. Father, thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.